There we go. So everyone should see our welcome slide. Thank you. Thanks, John. Here we are. Uh, this is, shows you some of our social media presence. And this is me. I'm Joanne Gear, the Executive Director of the Biopharma Research Council. Uh, I really like this slide. It comes from a conference we did last summer, uh, D2D, Data to Drugs and Diagnostics. And it really uh, underscores the mission of our entire community, which is to give opportunities, to share information, and to really learn about what's going on across uh, biomedical research because you never know where your next collaboration or partnership can, can come from and someone may have addressed a problem you already uh, you're addressing and can really help you. I'm going to share with you some of our upcoming programs. Uh, we're very pleased next Wednesday, Parta Sabeti is speaking on uh, her work in uh, on the Ebola outbreak. Uh, her name may be familiar to you for many reasons. She's been profiled in the New Yorker and the New York Times of late and uh, this will be a really terrific presentation. That's next Wednesday at uh, 2 o'clock. That's Eastern Daylight Time. Uh, on May 20th, we'll be in Boston. Uh, this is really terrific. So this is Advancing Drug Discovery Through Genome Engineering. We'll be looking at CRISPR and zinc fingers and talons and how the revolution in these new technologies is really pushing research forward. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is a really nice model. Uh, Merck actually invited us to organize this conference in order to look for potential partnerships and collaborations. It's open to everyone and it's definitely going to be a very uh, really lively event. Um, we go to uh, North Carolina once a year. This year it'll be October 29th and uh, we think the theme this year is going to be about technologies that are relevant to um, human health, animal health, and plant health. Uh, this is a new conference we're developing for this summer in Princeton, uh, the Internet of Medical Things, Cybersecurity and Discovery Development and Devices. And, you know, as, as we all know, everything you know, in the data revolution that we're living through, everything is available and, you know, how do we uh, collect the data, secure the data, analyze the data, share the data in safe environments, addressing risk and ongoing issue of the balance of, of safety and collaboration. Um, I'm just going to f fly through these, but just to show you that we have a wonderful range of people who are involved with the organization. Uh, we have a young investigators group, and these are people who are uh, working throughout the industry and, and academia. We have a scientific advisory board. Two of our members will be speaking today. We give awards uh, to folks who help both help our organization and who are uh, making a difference in uh, innovation and in research and so on. We love to partner with other organizations. We are based in New Jersey, so you'll see there are several New Jersey-based organizations that we're collaborating with, but many of these are in other places and we're very happy to uh, work internationally. And this is just a, a, a sampling of some of the organizations that have helped us either through providing speakers or other resources or sponsoring our events, spreading the word. We're really very pleased with uh, our community. We're, we're about uh, six years old, so it's been a nice growing process throughout that period of time. And finally, uh, I want to thank Intech, uh, which is an open source publishing company that is a key sponsor for, our, for this series. Uh, IES Diagnostics, which is where Winston Quo comes from, we're going to hear about in a moment. The NIH is giving us support. They're actually hosting a program in September, uh, September 24th on the microbiome. And Planet Connect, which is the founding sponsor of the, the Biopharma Research Council. Uh, and has given, continues to give terrific support. Uh, Planet Connect organizes internal conferences for Big Pharma and other uh, organizations. Please feel free to enter a question at any time. You have a question box in your dashboard. And here we are. Um, these, these next two are previous programs that are already uh, on recorded and on our website. So we did an introduction to the microbiome in December. Last week we had a terrific program in the systems biology approach. I'm sorry, that was April 9th, not the 19th. 
And here we are today. So we are going to be hearing from Dr. Camelia Martin, Winston Quo, and Howard Young. Um, I'm going to introduce you uh, to all three of them, and then we're going to hear from Dr. Quo, then we will hear from uh, Dr. Martin, and then we will open up our Q&A, and uh, Dr. Young will be participating. Dr. Winston Quo is the founder of the. I'm sorry. Is the founder of the. Uh, Harvard Medical School's Laboratory for Innovative Translational Technologies, part of the Clinical and Translational Science Award Program. His clinical and translational initiatives have expanded globally in developing countries such as Brazil, China, Mongolia, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, and South Africa, focusing upon accelerating understanding of mechanisms that affect human disease, catalyzing the identification and development of useful biomarkers, and speeding the development of therapeutics in patients. In addition to being the COO of EIS Diagnostics, he is founder and editor-in-chief of the Journal of Circulating Biomarkers and Nanobiomedicine. He has consulted with the NIH on interdisciplinary outreach and sits on a number of business and nonprofit scientific advisory boards, including the Biopharma Research Council. He received his Doctor of Medical Sciences in Oral and Computational Biology from Harvard Medical School. Dr. Camelia Martin's research interests are focused on neonatal nutrition and its impact on health and disease in the preterm infant. She has participated in multi-site clinical trials serving as the principal investigator evaluating growth and long-term neurodevelopment outcomes in the extreme preterm infant. She is the recipient of a Harvard Catalyst Faculty Fellowship Award facilitating her transition from general epidemiology to translational research. Dr. Martin received her MD from Cornell University School of Medicine, and in addition to her role at the Harvard Medical School, <clears throat> excuse me, she is Associate Director of the Neonatal Intensive Care Unit and the Director for Cross-Disciplinary Research Partnerships, the Division of Translational Research at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. Uh, Dr. Howard Young received his PhD from the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at the University of Washington and joined the National Cancer Institute in 1983, becoming Deputy Chief of the NCI Laboratory of Experimental Immunology in 2006. His, most recently, his laboratory has developed novel mouse models of lupus and aplastic anemia, and he is collaborating with a laboratory in Malaysia on the development of probiotic microorganisms as carriers for vaccine delivery systems. Dr. Young is a former president of the International Society for Interferon and Cytokine Research and is a two-time recipient of the National Cancer Institute Director's Award for Mentoring. He has also served as the chair of the Immunology Division of the American Society for Microbiology, chair of the NIH Immunology Interest Group and Cytokine Interest Group, and is a member of the American Academy of Microbiology, in addition to his position on our Scientific Advisory Board. Winston, would you like to share your presentation now? Thank you, Joanne. Um, as Joanne mentioned, my name is Winston Quo. I am the Chief Operating Officer of IES Diagnostics. I'm very delighted to participate in the Microbiome Short Course. Uh, my portion of the, today's webinar will be focused on recent highlights, updates, news on the microbiota and opportunities before we hear Dr. Kami Martin's talk. Over the past decade, it has become evident that the microbiome is an important environmental factor that affects many physiological processes such as cell proliferation, differentiation, behavior, immune function, and metabolism. More importantly, it may contribute to a wide variety of diseases, including cancer, metabolic diseases, inflammatory diseases, and responses to pathogens. Uh, as we heard from Rob Knight's talk last week, our body is a home to about 100 trillion bacteria microbiota microbial cells in and on our body and two million microbial genes. But each each one of us is have only about forty trillion human cells and approximately twenty thousand genes. So that equivocates to that the bacterial cells alone outnumber our own by a factor of twenty. So understanding the microbial side and interactions with us, that is the host, is of critical importance for our understanding of human biology variety of disease as mentioned, susceptibility to infectious disease, understanding more about chronic disease, even behavior and drug responses.
So it appears that the microbiome affects us directly from birth, whether traditional via traditional or C-section, until we, until we get old. Most of these microbes come from the mom's skin, birth canal, and gut when we're born. You hear more from Dr. Martin soon about this and its effects on development. But in a recent publication, a micro, microbe called bi, Bibifidobacterium has potential beneficial effects for babies, as they are among the first microbes to show up in a baby's intestinal tract after birth. The studies have suggested that a particular type of bifidobacteria can prevent infections and help establish the newborn's immune system. A single gene in the mom called FUT2 controls the behavior of bifidobacteria, and that gene also works through milk. You know, till we get older, the microbiome you know, plays a role from birth all the way to we, till we get old. But what happens when we get old? So there's a group from University College uh, that found differences in diet and living situations were highly correlated with differences in the gut microbiota composition and function, and whereas dietary interventions to promote healthier aging. So Bob Knight highlighted in his talk the systems biology approach to the micro, mi mi microbiome last week, and the key to his talk was to identify connections between microbes and different conditions in which we never thought of seeing the microbiota being involved that included obesity to different types of cancer to autoimmune disease like rheumatoid arthritis, and then mouse models even looking at things like autism, depression, and multiple sclerosis. And to find out which of these conditions the microbes cause and which of those conditions we can either predict or modify with improved knowledge about the microbial world. So we've come to appreciate how beneficial our microbes are in breaking down our food, fighting off infections, and nurturing our immune system. We carry up to two kilograms of microbes in our gut, and two-thirds of our gut is unique to each individual. But the question is how our gut microbiota could be influencing your health and the risk of disease. The microbes in our gut play an important role in digestion, although sometimes the stomach and small intestine are unable to digest certain foods, the gut microbes assist in assuring that we get the nutrients we get. For example, the gut microbe helps in the production of vitamins B and K, and these vitamins play a major role in the immune function. Perhaps the most studied is how the gut microbiota affects an individual's risk for obesity. So there are researchers from Cornell and King's College that found that certain strain of bacteria was more prevalent in people with low body weight, and that this presence of this particular strain is highly influenced by these genes. They introduced this bacteria to the guts of mice, which caused animals to gain less weight, indicating that the bacteria may reduce or prevent obesity. In another study, um, the lack of bacteria in the large intestine may drive obesity by slowing down the activity of brown fat, which protects against weight gain when stimulated by burning calories and white fat. And subsequently, Another group from NYU linked the antibiotic use and its modifications of the gut microbiota and the risk for obesity. So the gut has also been linked to a variety of cancers. Researchers, for example, have discovered a specific bacteria in the intestines called Lactobacillus jacini that may play a role in the development of lymphoma. In another study conducted by the researchers in UK have found that a common gut bacteria called Helobacteria pylori may cause stomach cancer and duodenal ulcers by activating a part of the immune system involved in regulating inflammation. And late last year, uh, investors from Mount Sinai associated a specific combination of gut bacteria with the development of colorectal cancer. So another hot area is mental health. Uh, can gut microbes alter the metabolites associated with communication between the gut and the brain, which in turn interfere with brain function? So it has been shown that bacteria does play a role in producing neurotransmitters like norepinephrine, serotonin, or dopamine. 
as well as how certain probiotic bacteria can actually modulate the effects of neurotransmitters. So in a microbe, microbe gut brain study in germ-free mice, it was demonstrated that the lack of microbes affects sociability, increases stress response, and decreases memory. And that particular study showed how the specific strain of lactobacillus rhamnosus modulates stress and its effect to appear to be mediated through the, va the vagus nerve in mice. So in a more recent study, uh, prebiotics, as carbohydrates, were found to boost uh, healthy bacteria in the gut, but may be effective for reducing stress and anxiety. So another area in terms of mental health uh, or is, is autism, and now it's estimated to be affected in 1 in 68 children in the U.S. While studies have associated environmental factors like pollution, genetics, uh, as potential cause of disorder, researchers are now looking at the role of gut bacteria in its development. So in 2013, there's a group from Arizona State University that found children with autism possessed lower levels of three types of gut bacteria, Prevotella, Copricosis, and Villanese, compared to children free of this condition. And further strengthening the association between the gut and autism is a recent study that was published in Cell that found bacterium bacteroides fragilis reduced autism-like symptoms in mice. So there's other studies that have shown association of intestinal microbes like Prevotella copri, colonization with the autoimmune disease, and rheumatoid arthritis. Another group from Cleveland Clinic linked microbes and cardiovascular disease and the role of bacteria in converting choline in trimethylamine oxide, which then promotes atherosclerosis. So on the flip side, what is the impact of gut microbes on drug metabolism? As the gut microbes are linked to cancer development, research has also identified gut bacteria may be important for improving the effectiveness of cancer treatment. So researchers from NCI and a group also from France found that immunotherapy and chemotherapy are less effective in mice lacking back, uh, gut bacteria with such treatments working significantly better in mice with normal uh, uh, microbiome. So these studies uh, <clears throat> are very exciting, which sort of outlines the initial links between gut microbiota and its response to therapies, and they underscored the importance of microbes in shaping not only our initial predisposition to disease, but also our, our recovery from that. So another study um, from Harvard, uh, Peter's group, identify certain strains of gut bacteria called Egotella lenta to carry a cytochrome operon that causes inactivation of a cardiac drug digidoxin. So these studies highlight the important role of the micro microbiome in altering the outcome of therapeutics. Uh, better standing, understanding of these interactions may someday allow us to devise strategies to improve drug efficacy and reduce side effects. So this brings up the topic of a healthy gut. What is a healthy gut? And this was also discussed by Rob Knight briefly last week. So in a healthy gut, how do specific bacterial genes control how some gut bacteria colonize the intestinal tract? In one study from Caltech, they looked at the bacteroides species in mice and found commensal colonization factor loci in bacteroides fragilis and bacteroides vulgatus that enable species specific physical interactions with the host that sort of mediate stable and resilient gut colonization. So that stress the importance of species specific genes that if absent could affect the establishment of a healthy microbiome. And subsequently another group from MIT showed that prior exposures to gut microbes can alter the immune system and the potency of Tregs thus lowering the risk of disease um, including cancer later in life. <clears throat> so I remember in the light of time, um, I would go quickly through the last two slides. So the skin microbiome. So the, um, there are huge developments on the research side and also on the commercial side and how the skin could be utilized as an organ for tissue-specific adjuvant and vaccine approaches. And the next is, can we manipulate our microbiome? 
So, for example, in Robert Knight's talk last week, he mentioned about Clostridium difficile. So, can we actually implement fecal microbiota transplantation in curing recurrent Clostridium difficile infection? And that has actually been shown to be uh, doable. And also, they've done this in mice in reference to obesity. So, there are a lot of commercial aspects in terms of this. So, you can imagine how this field is growing rapidly and the opportunities for clinical translational um, opportunities are huge in this in this field and I want to this so this these are the updates within the past couple of years in reference to the various different aspects and of course I did not mention a lot of other diseases that the microbiota plays a role but these are a few of the highlights and I want to thank everyone for participating um, in this webinar, and I want to pass the baton to the podium to uh, uh, Dr. Kimmy Morin. Thank you. Thank you, Winston, and <clears throat> thank you for the organizers of this session. Truly my honor to be participating in this. I want to, over the, the next part of the session, go over the establishment of the early microbiome in infants, but especially in preterm infants. And what we're learning is opening new challenges, but with those challenges, new opportunities. It's really fascinating and fun to study the microbiome in the infant, because probably in no other time during a person's life, there is a rapid succession of these exposures that influence microbiome development. And here along sort of this schematic timeline, early on during the maternal uh, phase and during delivery, the myth that this was a sterile in utero environment seems to be more and more debunked and that there is actually specific microbiomes within the placenta as well as even within the amniotic fluid. And early studies of the microbiome and sort of the first fecal um, meconium, the first stool out of the baby, when you're evaluating for the microbiome, you actually do see microorganisms. So maybe not as sterile as we once thought. And then after the route of delivery, whether it's a C-section delivery or a vaginal delivery, also influences early infant microbiome, with a vaginal delivery offering more in the way of colonization by what we consider commensal bacteria, such as the bi bifidobacterium or the lactobacillus. And then on the top here, skin-to-skin -skin contact, that initial hold with their parents and the mom starts to additionally transfer micro microbes that participate in the, in the colonization of the infant. Feeding choice, formula or breastfeeding also show very distinct patterns and again with breastfeeding offer the greater opportunity with colonization of commensal organisms, organisms that are very important for the health of the infant. Especially for our preterm infants and hospitalization, they are exposed to indigenous organisms, and indigenous hospital organisms are typically pathogenic, and therefore prolonged hospitalizations can actually alter that balance between commensal and pathogenic bacteria. And finally, we're learning more and more that the medications considered routine in our practice may also substantially change the microbiome of our infants and set them up for later disease. But this microbial colonization is, is essential to life and essential to the development of the immune system. Here's a nice study by McPherson and Harris in Nature Reviews in 2004. We're looking at germ-free mice and looking at all the immune centers. Notice that without exposure to microbial colonization to exogenous microbes, their poorly formed germinal centers in the spleen, the lamnia propria, the gut is deficient and low in CD4, an important immune um, cell. And then within the pyrus patches of the intestine, there decrease IgA, another nice immune um, defense of our host. But with microbe colonization and exposure to these microbes, you then begin to see the development of these germinal centers, increased expression of CD4, and increased expression of IgA. So that interface early on postnatal period with the microbial world is essential in developing your immune system. And exactly how you develop it may actually dictate later health, not only in the immediate newborn period and early childhood, but maybe even going into adulthood. 
So that interaction with the microbial colon, uh, community in the gut maintains integrity of the barrier, regulates appropriate bacterial colonization, activates intestinal immune defenses, and modulates intestinal inflammation. Throughout development of the tract, the point is, is that have the host have an appropriate balance between tolerating antigen stimuli that are being introduced into the gut, but also being prepared and ready and poised for an inflammatory attack if that was an abnormal antigen, so a bacterial antigen versus a, maybe a food antigen. But that inappropriate balance between the tolerance and the inflammatory attack can actually set up for later sort of immune, um, autoimmune diseases such as celiac disease or diabetes or even asthma or atopic disease. So if your intestinal tract doesn't properly develop, if your immune system within the tract, which is your largest immune organ, if it is not properly educated by a nice balance of the microbial uh, community, then you, are, you potentially may set up for these adult onset diseases. This is actually in the literature called developmental origins of adult disease. This dysbiosis in the preterm infant, where there is a greater proportion of what we consider pathogenic bacteria versus commensal bacteria, actually has been linked to intermediary pathways of poor immune defenses, dysregulated inflammation, and impaired organogenesis that then go on to lead to the more common morbidities we see in the NICU. Necrotizing enterocolitis, our version of inflammatory bowel disease, chronic lung disease where there's impaired lung development and a persistent need for oxygen therapy, or even nosocomial sepsis or infection acquired while in the hospital. The knowledge of how these exposures influence the microbiome in general from a population point of view has already started to promote practice changes. For the maternal side, the maternal medications like antibiotics, the routine administration of that are, are undergoing more and more increased scrutiny, as is the route of delivery and whether C-sections have to be performed or whether we should reconsider that, uh, those criteria for C-sections and to promote more in the way of vaginal delivery. But it's all in trying to kind of replicate processes which we know tend to in favor to tend to have a more favorable microbiome and, and favorable outcomes to health. So one example with the rooted delivery is C-section and, and strategies that investigators are starting to use is you can't eliminate C-sections completely. But what a, you know? How about this as a strategy with Dr. Maria Gloria Dominguez Bello out of NYU School of Medicine? said, so, well, if we know it's going through the vaginal canal that gives you exposure to these diverse organisms, and many of them commensal and important to infant health, if you bypass this canal through C-section, can you possibly take a cloth, let it incubate in the vaginal canal for a little bit, and then after the baby is born, use that cloth to actually resuscitate and do your routine drying and stimulation and sort of transfer that microbiome that was otherwise missed because of the C-section rather than the vaginal delivery. Sort of innovative strategies like this is coming out of us understanding how general medical practices influence the microbiome. In addition, skin-to-skin -skin contact. In our NICU, um, in previous uh, decades, it wasn't unusual that we uh, tried to isolate the infant as much as possible, keep them in the isolate, minimal stimulation and minimal handling. But understanding now that maybe that such a degree of restriction may be not promoting good microbio, um, microbiome and, and the exposure to the, the diverse microbiome that's important for them, that we're trying to increase skin-to-skin -skin contact with family. And so when mothers come in, have the opportunity in very controlled situations and very extremely preterm infants, allow them to kangaroo care, which we call the skin-to-skin, -skin, where mom holds the baby, keeps the baby warm while the nurses are making sure all the other vitals are, are stabilized and doing well. But this, besides a lot of the emotional support that's very important in bonding between mom and baby, is actually help facilitating transfer of some of these important commensal microorganisms and influencing the microbiome of the infant. 
breastfeeding and the immunonutrients. So understanding how breast milk influences the microbiome and really putting in a lot of effort to make sure we're delivering that as much as possible and as early as possible. But even work within the specific nutrients in the breast milk is helpful because if for some reason we're not able to give a volume of breast milk to an extremely preterm infant, is there something about the composition of it or a specific immunonutrient that we could provide that can still enhance and allow the normal development of the intestinal tract to happen? So a lot of literature is coming out about human milk oligosaccharides and how these complex undigestible sugars that are found in human milk more so than almost any other species that within the oligosaccharides of this milk it has been determined that it does influence the microbial composition. In addition to influencing the microbial composition, it's a very important in blocking bacterial and viral attachment as well as invasion. So I think continuing to work on these specific dietary components can pull out those immunonutrients that are essential such that when we have situations that we can't provide, we have an alternative strategy to be able to enhance intestinal gut development during those early vulnerable periods of an infant's life. Here in the hospital situation, understanding microbial patterns also helps assist in handling or cohort practices of infants during their hospitalization. I think the biggest substantial change recently is also the understanding of medication exposures and what that does to a developing gut and, and probably even more so outside infancy and that is the exposure of antibiotics or, or H2 blockers. Back in about probably the early 2000s, large uh, cohort studies out of the NICHD showed that for every day of an antibiotic exposure, it increased the risk of an infant getting necrotizing enterocolitis by 4%. And then every time it was prolonged beyond five days, that, ex that risk of necrotizing enterocolitis went up an additional 40%. And similar studies came out out of H2 blockers, something we used very commonly in the NICU as we do with antibiotics. And as a result of the literature and also the subsequent microbiome data of infants receiving antibiotics or not or receiving H2 blockers or not, have really curtailed our use or made us be more again um, um, you know thoughtful about what we initiate and how long we initiate in our infants which I think is a is, is a great improvement forward on the left is a Simpson diversity scale of the microbial colonization or the microbiome in infants and you see that first week of exposure of antibiotics, this is no antibiotics and then one to four days versus five to seven days, that first week you don't see much change but then the subsequent week two and week three you start to see how that over total um, abundance as well as diversity begins to come down with prolonged use of antibiotics. On the right is an example from the literature of what happens when infants are exposed to histamine 2 receptor blockers where when you're exposed, which is are the dark filled uh, circles, you have an increased abundance in the class of proteobacteria compared to those that were not exposed. So additional increasing evidence that medications absolutely influence this early microbiome causing shifts that are known to also increase the risk of necrotizing enterocolitis. And I think all of that has been very helpful in continuing to, to change our practices and be cognizant of what we're doing in sort of at the bedside as, as clinical care providers and really setting up systems that are going to affect the baby even beyond, well beyond the NICU. But also in looking at this data, I feel like it poses some challenges and challenges about how do we apply these principles for individual personalized medicine where you may see patterns and populations, but sometimes those patterns overlap. And when you look more specifically and carefully within individuals or within infants, there is actually a tremendous amount of variability, especially in infants from week to week, but also between individuals. 
So how do we carry over our knowledge of the microbiome and look more specifically in certain classes of infants or even individual infants? And so for the next few slides, I'm just going to talk a little bit about illustrating that point. And when in our lab and when we do the microbiome research with our collaborators, what are some of the things that we're thinking about? So let me take you back to the antibiotic literature that even when you start to look and compare these groups, there's significant overlap between the duration of the antibiotics and exactly what's happening with this shift in this diversity. I think this one with the H2 blockers maybe illustrates it even more so that yes, you can see that the abundance or the mean relative abundance is different, but look at the substantial overlap. There's a very distinct and unique individual response or the intestinal host response to these exposures that I think we still need to clarify and define even more. Here's another example from a colleague, Dr. Erica Claude out in Chicago has been doing some wonderful neonatal microbiome research and she was looking at the infant microbiome and the risk of necrotizing enterocolitis. And so in panel A, the control group, you see the, the distribution of the phylum and the proteobacteria versus other. So just looking at proteobacteria versus the other, you see they're relatively balanced. But then the infants with necrotizing enterocolitis, a substantial increase in the proteobacteria. I showed you a similar shift with the H2 blockers. And in the literature, this has been called sort of a blooming of the proteobacteria class that's setting you up for risk and risk for necrotizing enterocolitis. So as a population um, view, it is helpful and it's helpful to understand that shift. However, when you look at the individuals here in panel B and panel C, the ends are the neck cases. This was a case control study. So N was the necrotizing enterocolitis, and C are the controls. Well, just comparing pattern to pattern across the normals or the no or the necks, I mean, and even comparing from control to control, a huge variation in what is the dominant species of this microbial community. And in fact, those that got neck, you'll see Enterobacter, Shigella, Haemophilus, Klebsiella, E. coli. Well, here in the controls, you see E. coli and Klebsiella. So a lot of overlap within the individual. So what is it else about the individual that set them at risk to subsequently go on to get necrotizing enterocolitis? And I think it's those answers on the individual level that will help us bring our microbiome research from the population to the bedside. Here's another one. Uh, this is work from our lab looking at the population differences and then the unique individual signatures. This study is we undertook in 10 infants, looked at, the, at two weeks of age, took samples from the oral cavity, the trachea, uh, they were intubated, the gastrum, and the, and the lower intestinal tract and the fecal samples. And what we were wanting to ask is, you know, in general, understand the distribution across the GI tract, but wanted to know whether the oral or even the tracheal aspirates could be a biomarker, a potential biomarker indicator of what's happening in the lower intestinal tract and, at, and whether that sets you up as res, risk of disease and necrotizing enterocolitis. So in infants, they don't regularly stool all the time. So can we use another sample such as their saliva or a tracheal aspirate that would give us an indication of what's happening in lieu of having a fecal sample every day? And so when we look at it, again, as a population in the entire cohort, you can almost see that the phylum distribution in the oral cavity did seem very similar, very close to what we see in the fecal cavity. So maybe there is some possibility that the oral microbiome is reflective of what's going on in the lower intestinal tract. But if you look in figure two and we dive deeper into the individuals, it became muddier, so to speak. So here in this one infant, the oral and the fecal distribution looked remarkably similar. So it kind of goes along with our potential hypothesis. But if you look at the middle panel in B, it doesn't look, it seems to start to, to separate a little bit about what these two populations look like from the oral or the intestinal tract. And then in C, even more of a marked difference. And this is the same age, same time, just looking at these different cavities. Well now, it, you know, we're learning more and more that even different um, 
you know, different compartments within the same cavity, you're going to get a very different microbiome signature. But what I think this taught our lab and where we want to sort of try to probe a little bit deeper is that it can be sometimes misleading looking at populations alone instead of understanding what makes up that in the inter-individual, the individual differences. Finally, to illustrate this point is some data we're working with now on this bottom panel where there, every infant is in four bars. So this is one infant at week one, week two, week three, week four, and then another infant, one, two, three, four, and so forth. And you see within the individuals, again, across time, marked shifts even within the individual, but also compared between individuals. So where we're moving with this information and trying to understand those, that individual variation that might give us additional clues of how the microbiome is interacting with the host and especially the intestinal host, is thinking about integrating with the other omic technologies. On the left is sort of a typical slide or image that you'll see taking you from the genomics to the transcriptomics, proteomics, and then the final, what's considered sometimes the final phenotype of the, of the host, the metabolomics. But on the right, in this more recent publication, I really enjoyed their depiction of these processes because now they're overlaying this microbiome space. Clearly, the microbiome is another layer which influences each of these other spaces that you can determine biomic technology. And I think to do one layer in isolation is not going to be able to help answer those personalized medicine choices going forward in the future. So I'm going to show you an application where we've been working on to see if we can start to tease some of those um, interrelationships um, out. So one of the main questions we've had is, well, how can, how do medications, the lack of any enteral feeding or breast milk versus formula or other fortifiers we use in the NICU, how does that specifically, individually, affect the host response, not only in the microbiome development, but that that subsequent gene expression or expression of the epithelium of the intestine in response to that microbiome or to that intervention. And understanding that may give us a better idea of what we need to do here early and at the bedside to prevent these later sequelae. So what is that relationship between the microbiome and the epithelial transcriptome? Well, in the next few slides, I'm going to talk about how we've teased out ways in which we can actually start to look at the gut's transcriptome so that we can apply these system biology approaches. This work has been in collaboration with an amazing team at Texas A&M and also the University of Illinois using non-invasive ways to look at gene expression of the intestinal epithelium. And it's our understanding why we think it's important to pursue this is because the, uh, to, to get a handle of what's regulating the immune inflammatory functions of the gut along that developmental timeline in that postnatal period. But we do not have access. We're limited by the inability to directly look at the gut, to take biopsies, or to get any kind of tissue. That is largely not possible for us. So is there a way that we can non-invasively uh, acquire transcriptomics from isolated epithelial cells in fecal samples? So moving forward and in, in, in the NICU and creating this biorepository, we collected stool samples in preterm infants, and we collected those samples in an RNA later. Using poly-A1 RNA isolation, we could select for the mRNA of eukaryotics. And then converting that to cDNA and so forth, being able to then create the Illumina libraries, sequence it, confirm gene expression by real-time PCR, and then perform some pathway analysis. So this was a proof of concept study as well and compared it to a group of full-term infants who were breastfed. So ideally our gold standard, you're born early, where should you be at an equivalent of full-term age? You're receiving a lot of other enteral intakes outside of just breast milk, but where should you be compared to a full-term breastfed infant? Well, in performing these procedures, 171 genes were differentially expressed between preterm and full-term infants. And many of the pathway maps identified differences in lipid metabolism, 
cellular movement, immune cell trafficking, and small molecule biochemistry and molecular transport. And to be very specific, and just to give you know one highlight, is the lipid metabolism against the immunity and inflammation. And here is a similar, so this is a pathway map of the gene expression from stool samples in a non-invasive way, looking at exactly what the, um, how the epithelium of, of the intestines is reacting to its environment. And so the preterm infants, when overexpressing these genes, are in red, and those that are overexpressed in term compared to preterm are in green. And this was not only being a proof of concept, but this was very enlightening to our group because of the overexpression, as you see, of, the, of many of these inflammatory markers and immune markers, and then also of lipid metabolism. And there's uh, projects that we're conducting about the way preterm infants process their nutrients, especially lipids, and how that might be contributing to immune autogeny and inflammation. So it was exciting to see that compared to a full-term breastfed infant, that these changes are in fact evident. And this just says, you know, summarizes that, that with these lipid metabolism, we know a preterm infant has impaired lipid hydrolysis and immune function. It's this dysregulated and pro-inflammatory responses that set them up for disease and being able to balance these functions against being able to address injury and then have appropriate repair mechanisms in place subsequently. And so this was a nice way to now we have a non-invasive approach that will allow for sequential and longitudinal monitoring of gene expression in real time and coupling that with our metabolomics and microbiome data so that we can get at getting moving away from the population shifts and starting to see more of the individual interactions and the individual infants and in what is happening. Um, during that sensitive to postnatal developmental period. So the newborn infant undergoes rapid exogenous exposures that influence microbial colonization. The preterm infant is particularly vulnerable to dysbiosis and subsequent morbidities. But these unique individual microbiome signatures that can represent, I think, a challenge in sometimes applying to population health can be translated um, to in integrating with omic strategies to the individual and more personalized medicine at the bedside. And through those mechanisms may unco uncover more predictable patterns to exposure, such as the oligosaccharides or lactoferrins or medications, so that we know how to apply that on a population basis um, for infants that are in uh, unique situations that removes them from normal exposures that I showed earlier on that optimizes overall micro, uh, microbial communities. And wanted just a quick acknowledgement of all of the funding that requires to go into these complex studies and these collaborations. Very grateful for that. And thank you. I appreciate your attention and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Martin. This is a terrific presentation. Um, I have a couple of questions that have come in. I want to encourage everyone to add uh, your questions to the box on the right-hand side. Um, and we're going to invite uh, Dr. Kuo and Dr. Young to participate in the next phase here. Um, I have a question here. Could speakers please comment on the role of viruses and or fungi in the microbiome? Yeah, um, that, that's a great point, and I think that with increasing technology, we're, we're going to be able to um, evaluate that even further. Personally, the work that we, I have been doing has been more in the bacterial side. I know the viruses have been um, also of interest and also playing a role in necrotizing enterocolitis, and especially in the epidemics that we see sometimes within a new, uh, NICU. In, um, in the development of necrotizing enterocolitis, but that, that's about as, we're, as far as my knowledge goes on both of those agents. Okay, here's another question. There is a routine group B strep test, GBS, that pregnant women undergo before giving birth, and if they test positive for this, they are given antibiotics when they get to the hospital for birth. Has there been any research of how this practice might alter the microbiome of the newborn, i.e., perhaps a study between GBS plus uh, receiving antibiotics versus GBS mothers not getting any antibiotics? 
I think that's a, an, an excellent question, and there's been no doubt that our routine screening of GBS status in moms and the package of care that when positive they receive, such as you mentioned with antibiotics, has significantly reduced the amount of early onset GBS sepsis that we see in newborns, which can be um, a significant morbidity and even mortality when they get that. Having said that, the literature on the effect of antibiotics during that critical transition on the microbiome has, has raised this issue again about whether the procedures and the, and the protocols right now that are in many of the hospitals that are based out of the CDC recommendations, whether they may be perhaps too strict and can we reevaluate how at the bedside we are identifying infants that are truly at risk for early onset GBS to minimize the, no, the exposure of hundreds and hundreds of babies. I mean the, the incidence now is very low but we will evaluate babies very routinely and that evaluation includes blood, pre, uh, blood cultures and maybe a course of antibiotics until we get that blood culture back. Maybe that needs to be reassessed. Maybe that is too stringent and overexposure of antibiotics. And there are some groups out there that are looking at new, um, looking at new mathematical models that we can employ at the bedside and be a little bit more precise of that risk so we can minimize overexposure to antibiotics. A study directly has not been done about those that were evaluated sepsis for, uh, for the rule out sepsis versus those don't. I think that would be very enlightening. Maybe someone out there has some preliminary data. I haven't seen it in the literature yet, but just the concept of knowing what antibiotics do to an infant's microbiome, we're already reassessing those practices and I think in a good way. So that leads me into my question, Cammie. This is Howard Young. Has any thought been given to uh, trying to alter the microbiome of pregnant women? In other words, I'm sure with women with uh, auto, autoimmune disease or maybe inflammatory bowel diseases, that might be considered. But just in general, has there been any thought about trying to create a, a different microbiome or, or modify it in, uh, during pregnancy? Yeah, and, and you would imagine that that would definitely be the next step as we keep moving further and further back and realizing that's not a sterile environment and that the maternal microbiome may have very important influences even during fetal development. Those actual studies though, Howard, and what they look like, I have not seen in the literature yet or have been exposed to that information. Thank you. We have another question here from our audience. Uh, given that there is such variability and heterogeneity in predominant bacteria in the gut, how do we make sense of the gene expression markers in the NICU study? Yes, I, and, and that's exactly the challenge. You know, when, when the, the literature on the necrotizing enterocolitis came out, you're thinking, okay, can we identify, a, you know, a, a specific signature or a phenotype, but you see the overlap. And I can't say, oh, okay, if that organism is prominent, they're going to go on to, to necrotize anticolitis. That actually may not be the case. There may be some setup in that risk and identifying who may be at high risk, but it may not necessarily be the case. I think it's understanding these general, these general findings that we see in the population in our human data, and I think it's really employing that, that translational approach, going then back into the animal models and back to the bench and see if we can sort of isolate out what was that specific response to that specific exposure and then going back to the clinics and the and the um, human side of clinical research and seeing if we can detect that those are indeed predictable patterns and, and trying to iteratively refine those relationships as best we can. I do worry about overexposing, just like the GBS, overexposing to specific interventions such as probiotics in a preterm infant to a large number of infants who may not need that. And then I think that back and forth and that clinical translational approach will, will be essential in, in trying to tease out that complexity. Great. Here's another one. Um, is there any effect of maternal antibiotic use during breastfeeding on the infant's microbiome? Um, good question. You know, I, I'm, again, I'm not, I haven't seen anything specifically in the literature that studies that, that has studied that. Now, there are some bacterial organisms even within the breast milk. And um, so I guess a corollary question would be, does it alter the microbiome of the breast milk? And I, I haven't seen studies to that nature yet. 
Okay. Um, where do the speakers see the biggest initial impact in diagnosis, for example, biomarker signatures or in therapeutics in trying to change microbiomes? Hmm. I don't know, Winston, Howard, do you have any thoughts while I keep thinking what would be the biggest <laughs> impact? That's a <laughs> tough question. I, I think everybody is searching for biomarkers that mean yeah. something. So that could have the biggest impact if they're indeed able, if people are able to identify biomarkers that really are biomarkers and not uh, 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 false uh, flags in the air. Right. Uh, um, so for the initial uh, impact, I think that's where that would come in. It's complicated, right? Yeah, definitely. It's complicated. <laughs> Biology is complicated. <laughs> Um, I have two questions from the same person, so I'll put them both out, and uh, this may be our last question, but if someone has one more, feel free to enter it. <clears throat> so the first part of the question is, despite the bacterial heterogeneity, is there some commonality of the micro microbial gene expression among people having different bacterial compositions? And this is not necessarily the follow-on question, but I'm just going to ask it because it's the same person. Certain sugar substitutes have antibiotic properties. Is there any impact on the gut microbiota and impact on disease? So the first question, and, and I probably I had the slide in and maybe I should have left it, but again, um, tipping my hat to my Texas A&M colleagues, and if you look up Dr. Chapkin's work, preceding the preterm study to see if we can even isolate you know the intestinal cells and the and and look at the transcriptomics they had with Sharon Donovan had looked at a cohort of full term infants breastfed or exclusively formula fed and at 3 months of life looked at the transcriptomics and did couple it with the microbial uh, microbiome analysis as well and they did see very distinct patterns between the diet as well as uh, distinct differences of whether you were formula fed or breastfed in the context of that microbial community in its gene expression um, and, and something you would anticipate where um, the genes involved in homeostasis and intestinal repair tend to be more over over expressed or expressed and compared to formula fed infants and um, so I, I do refer you to that study I think it, it explains that very nicely is how you can start to bring together those other aspects of the omic technology and get a sense of how the gut is specifically that epithelial microbial epithelial um, interaction which is important to understand how that specifically might be manipulated not only by the microbiome but by other exposures such as diet differences well, I really want to thank everyone. I'd like to give an opportunity to our speakers. Do you have any sort of final comments that you would like to make before we part? Uh, Dr. Young, do you have anything you'd like to share? Well, I think this, this talk, this excellent talk today, really demonstrates how the microbiome is being considered in all aspects of human biology and in areas that people never thought of before, that, it's be, it, that the data is beginning to show that it is important and it, can, and it does impact on disease, on many different diseases, not just gut diseases. Um, and so I think this is, as everyone probably appreciates that's participating in the, in the we webinar today, that this is a, an area that's just going to grow, that more data is going to be uh, obtained, and perhaps that's our biggest challenge, to be able to handle all the data that will be generated and turn it into meaningful uh, understanding of how the microbiome affects uh, our health and well-being. Beautiful. Uh, yeah, I completely, I, I was just going to say I completely agree, you know, as an investigator and, and initially looking at the microbiome, sometimes that complex, complexity can be can be daunting and, and, and you don't want to necessarily pursue it because it is a difficult process to go through, but as in the title of the talk and new challenges, I think if anything, you begin to you embrace the complexity and you, and you begin to dive deeper into it, you appreciate that the fact that you're uncovering this complexity allows for all these new, different and new opportunities and there are emerging tools that um, I think will allow us to, to understand what's going on across these different systems and how we can eventually bring that to practice on a more consistent basis. Wonderful. Dr. Quo, do you have, would you like to share a final thought? i take him a moment to unmute himself. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and thank you. Oh, there you are. Go ahead, Dr. Quill. No, I just want to say no, I just want to say thank you uh, for a great presentation, and I both uh, uh, agree with both uh, Cami and Howard in their statements. And just it's just that uh, there's so much work has to be done, and uh, uh, and the microbiome follows through the course of our lives, uh, from birth all the way till we get old. So it's a lot of work to do. Well, I think that's a wonderful final thought. Thank you. Um, same time next week, we're going to be looking with Rob Knight at Spatially Explicit Maps. On the 30th, we're looking at the impact of the microbiome on cancer uh, medication. May 21st is a roundtable, and I'm actually going to be collecting up all of the questions we've received in all of our sessions to share with a panel of experts that will have a uh, discussion throughout the whole presentation. And uh, please mark your calendars for September 24, when we will have a full day in-person conference at Fort Detrick, uh, hosted by the uh, National Cancer Institute and the NIH, uh, to uh, really meet and address many of these questions. I want to thank everyone for coming. Thank you to our presenters. It's a particularly wonderful presentation. And uh, look forward to seeing everyone next week. Thank you so much. Thank you.